Welcome back to the Pod of Greed. That's right. So uh, this one's going to be a fun podcast, I think. Yes, because we're coming off of at least a hot Yu-Gi-Oh! week for us. I don't know about how it was for you guys. Yeah, very exciting Yu-Gi-Oh! weekend. But we got to start, of course, with... A shout out to anybody watching oh, yeah. live on YouTube. Yeah, ones put your chat. ones up. Make sure that you like the premiere. I think that promotes it to more people. Whatever. Or something. Speaking of likes, we do have a review. Oh, how many stars? Okay, so we have a five star review. Okay, all right. And um, <laughs> the this review is titled "A Better Yu Gi Oh Product Than Most Stuff Konami Puts Out." Whoa! Wow. I've been following Paul, Paul for over a decade now, and watching him and Alec grow and develop as presenters makes me feel like a proud family member. <laughs> the show feels like a culmination of their growth and experience. These two will tell you what you need to know about Yu Gi Oh. Uh, without it feeling dry or overwhelming, which are pitfalls many other shows have fallen victim to, they keep things light and digestible and eliminate the likelihood of Yu-Gi-Oh! fatigue by delving into other interests as well. Each podcast feels like you're catching up with the boys, and these guys should be very proud of the product they've put together. Oh, I, yeah, I like that one. This guy's name is Alexanderfer. Alexanderfer? Yeah, Alexanderfer. That's a, that's a fun name. I, if that's actually his real name, that's really cool. If it's like a username, that's also cool, but if like... If there's Alexander someone named Alexander Fur, there's an- another just retooling of that Alexander name. It's one of the most overly like reused names in history. You would know, huh? As an Alec, yeah. I, I do. As an Alec who gets called Alex a fair bit, all the time. Yeah, a lot of people just default to to Alex. Which would I wouldn't have a problem with that if Alex didn't also exist. <laughs> so we got to talk about the. Yu-Gi-Oh! Quarter Century Celebration live stream. This is what happened mm-hmm. last weekend. It was the event that we were a part of. I was not entirely sure going into it what all that would entail. I mean... I wasn't even sure if it was going to get off without a hitch. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, it did. Uh, so, spoiler, nothing crazy, you know, disastrous <laughs> happened anyway. But, so, a little bit of background, I guess, on what it is. We've been talking about it for the last few weeks. It's mm-hmm. this three-day-long live stream that Konami did to just sort of celebrate, I guess, Yu-Gi-Oh!'s 25th anniversary for the TCG territories, at least. And they really did try to incorporate all facets of Yu-Gi-Oh! in this live stream event. Yeah, so you had the Master Duel 2nd Anniversary Invitational, mm-hmm. the Duel Link 7th Anniversary Invitational, yep. and then you had the um, Undisputed UDS Championship, which invited um, the 16 players who'd won UDS belts in the past into this sort of, like, just 16-man... Battle Swiss Royale for the top. Kind of um, tournament. And in addition to that, in between like different games and stuff, they were playing anime episodes. Plenty of anime episodes. And they did like a Yu-Gi-Oh! round table. Mm-hmm. So it's just a lot of really cool stuff. A lot of people came together, I think, to make this happen. There were a lot of different commentators, content creators were involved, like yep. on site. Um is what there was pheromone, DZ, Cyber Knight, uh, Jobber, Jobber, MST TV, or Tom Box. You know he does like commentary and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. lots of uh, just lots of interesting faces. So uh, that was a lot of the people that were actually playing like in the Master Duel thing and stuff were like at the Konami office. Mm-hmm. We were doing this remotely, so we just played from home and like live streamed it. Which was, uh, I was it more or less stressful? You think? I mean, it's its own thing. Because I mean, I feel like I, it would uptight. At the Konami office doing all that. It might have been more relaxed there, though. Because, like, everybody would be there so you could kind of just hang out. So, like, whenever your thing is done, you just sort of, like, relax. And then, also, they would have been handling all the tech stuff on their end. Right. Which, um, in the meantime, I had to handle the tech <laughs> stuff on my end. When I don't uh, really love live streaming. It's not my preferred. Live streaming stresses me out. Yeah, it's not my preferred means of, like, creating content. I just, I'm always anxious about, like, things going wrong. Mm. Like, well, the audio cut out is the... Is there something lagging? You know, is like, the internet gonna cut? I remember, you had a weird audio delay early into your live stream, and then it fixed itself before you. I think you had to really do anything. That was so weird, and I was so nervous because I was like, "Oh my god, like what am I gonna have to do here?" So, <laughs> yeah, like stuff like that it just gives me anxiety. I don't, I don't love uh, live streaming, but anywho, I did do it, and so I played in Master Duel. Alec played in Duel Links, mm-hmm. specifically Rush Duel Links. Yeah, so I guess I figure what we could probably do is just each go over like our just experience matches not like obviously in detail because I mean they wouldn't yeah. really be like watching it but just the gen- the gist of how it went for us makes sense all right um so I was first I did master duel I was on team doom donuts that was the name <laughs> of my team and we were playing against um the hungry burgers 
And so the Doom Donuts captain was Jesse Cotton. The Hungry Burgers captain was Joshua Schmidt. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a really good rivalry kind of thing to have. Two titans. To have going there, uh, two titans of the game, kind of the North America titan, the EU titan. Um, And so on my team was also Rhyme Style and Crip, and um, I was the last person on the team. And then we were playing against uh, Syriax, played against like Rhyme Style, Chilled Chaos played against uh, Crip, and then I had to play against Paulo Gonzalez, who uh, was probably the big mismatch of like going into the event. I knew you had him. Yeah, the assumption was that like the teams are mostly evenly matched, but um, then I had to play against a, a guy who's gotten forty premier event tops. That's like across UDS <laughs> events, YCS <laughs> events. He won three like YCS events like in a row. I don't know if like, he he won a team YCS. <laughs> Then another YCS and then a UDS, all within like like back to back, like in 2019 or something. So yeah, and then in addition to like again the 40 tops. So really good guy, uh, really good at Yu-Gi-Oh. You could say. Luckily, the pandemic slowed him down. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> no, not really. Um, so starting off Master Duel, it was like Crypt versus Chilled Chaos, and this was Konami's kind of thing where they start the event off with two people who aren't really like known Yu-Gi-Oh. Mm-hmm. Creators, are they, they're like kind of bigger variety and games. It's kind of variety streamers. gaming people. I know Crypt plays a lot of Hearthstone. Um, Jilled, play, Jilled Chaos plays a lot of the different games. Um, their match was a 3 0 in yeah. Jilled Chaos's favor. He played Monodium against um, Crypt's Grin Maju deck, which I thought was a pretty interesting decision giving him a deck like Grin Maju because Grin Maju seems like a simple deck. I actually don't think it is as much. It, I actually, I've, that's my feeling on every anti meta deck. Um, anti-meta decks are funny. They seem simple on the surface because of how they interact with the meta games at, at the times that they're introduced. Yeah. But there's a reason they're anti-meta and not meta. Mm-hmm. They don't have these lines of like card advantage and supply that just keep pumping into their hands each turn. Right. Yeah, that's something that so as somebody who's actually I played the Grin Maju deck. I played against your Grand Maju deck. Yeah, I played it competitively for about a year, like in twenty nineteen. Uh, that was kind of in what I would call its prime. And I do know a fair bit about the deck, I'll say. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that the big issue with the Grin Maju deck, just as a, as like a strengths and weaknesses thing, is that it's good for OTKing people. Like, you go second, you kind of just break the board and try to OTK them. But you do have to really know, like, what, you're, what board you're breaking and, like, how to kind of... What's the way to sequence that board break? You cannot because, misuse your cards. Yeah, because you don't get, like second chances with decks mm-hmm. like that you don't really get a second a, a second turn really the deck doesn't recover yeah there's not really any recovery to it and you have to know exactly how to like like how are you going to bait this barone or how are you going to bait this other negation or if you have a kaiju what do you kaiju first because you're only going to kaiju one thing or whatever so um yeah you know that didn't go super well so our team was not starting off on a good foot um crip got three owed and so then my round comes along and i have to face paulo and everybody was counting me out of this. I remember there yeah. were some not kind uh, memes being made about me leading up to this event. There were memes? I didn't see the memes. Yeah, like the hydrogen bomb versus the coughing baby meme. I don't know if you've Why? seen this. No, I have not seen this. Oh, it's something like MBT posted or something. <laughs> and um, I mean, it wasn't good fun. But yeah, so I had to play against Paulo, and I used Vanquish Soul, a deck that I really like. Mm, and no, he was using Zodiacs. And. Um, I did, going into it, I had no clue what deck he was going to be using. Mm-hmm. So I like I found out literally just when his first card was activated, and um, I was so thankful when I found out that he was playing Zodiac because Zodiac is a pretty favorable matchup for Vanquish Soul. It's a bit of an older theme, so like it's obviously not as like complex and insane as maybe a modern deck would it's be. It's insane that we're now we're boiling Zodiac down to a simple strategy now. Yeah, well, it also there's a few cards missing from Zodiac still. Like they're not broad bowl, right? But yeah, um, they don't. So uh, it was Vanquish Soul versus Zodiac, and I was able to pretty convincingly win the first two games. Unfortunately, made some mistakes in the third game, which did allow it, him to take a win. And so I really wanted to get a 3-0. That would have been great. You were close. I was close. You I, were I, close. I, I had a plan. I, it was a misclick with, like, a stake your soul. I won't get into it too much. But um, I really wanted the 30, like, 30 and a handshake type of victory, and mm-hmm. I could really talk shit. But <laughs> um, I will take a 2-1. I did win my round. And then after that, uh, Rhyme Style beat Syriax, and then finally Jesse beat Josh. And so my team, the Doom Donuts, won the Master Duel part Good of the uh, QCC stream. Let's hear about it from you. 
All right. So I was at. So Paul was the. Um, you were the. You're the second game in your event, right? Yeah. Out of four so rounds, I was the second. For round. mine, I was the third. And in the speed duel format, we actually had to play five rounds, not three, five, not best of five, five. No, you had. There were four. Hmm. You guys had four. Oh, I'm. Oh, I, I misspoke. Right. I misspoke. Oh, I meant you meant in each of our rounds. Oh, yeah, you guys. We had play, to play yeah, five, five iterations. Games. Five sorry, games. Yeah, yeah, we played three. Yeah, sorry, my bad, my bad. Yeah. So the issue we ran into with Duel Links was uh, that took incredibly long. They really did. They really did. <laughs> we start. I should say what the teams were. So I was on Team Bacon Savers against Team Ghost Beef. It was me. Oh, I, I can never ties. say ties. <laughs> Pheromone and Zeta, and we each were to play rush duels, then speed duels, rush duels, then speed duels. So, yeah. Ty's played rush duels, he was part of the kind of content creator block where they both played starter decks. Yeah. And I really think Konami should have thought better than that. Yeah, uh, I think just kicking that off, I think that those starter decks were so rush duel. I'm guessing that they wanted to split Rush Duel and Speed Duel to give them both some shine. Yeah, and so people I, they certainly want to show Rush Duel, but... I think that Rush Duels... A, I heard those starter decks were not really very well balanced. They weren't, because uh, it was uh, Ties versus Gerbigli, and Gerbigli got one of the more recent ones, and Ties got one of the older ones, and Ties decks monsters were across the board weaker than Gerbigli's. And I could forgive all of that if they didn't each just have one copy of their starter decks. So they were really scraping by. Yeah, yeah. I think that it also five straight rounds of that was like Mind five nine. Like games of that was it was it just went forever. But the main problem I have with like Speed Duel doing um five rounds of this. By the way, guys, I should probably say like you might if you didn't watch this this weekend, you might want to like kind of. Skim through the vods. There's vods everywhere. Or, or Every Konami's content channel. creator has one. So just so you kind of have like a better idea of what we're talking about, because I know it might it might sound like it's just going over people's heads. Um, but basically, five straight games of like rush duel with starter decks. It drags on forever. The games weren't super exciting. The oh, honestly, the only entertaining part about it was Gerbigli's misplays. I don't know if he was doing it on purpose for entertainment, but uh. It was kind of the only thing that could that could be interesting in the Star Deck game because they each only had one copy of their boss monsters. And if you guys, if you play Rush Duels, you know those level seven monsters, they're the point. If you only have one in your deck, yeah. it's gonna be very boring. Yeah, Rush Duel and it can Rush Duel kinda has a way of uh extending a little longer than I sometimes would like when like a person's just setting three monsters and then like you kill the three monsters when their next turn they draw five again and just get to set three. Yeah. And so because there's not really any strategy beyond that, like in the starter decks that is, mm -hmm. it those games really went a while. But But that did it did end and Ty's somehow scraped together the act the lead there. And yeah. he won, was it 4-1? I think it was like 4-1. Yeah, I think it was 4-1. So then in the next round... Or like 3-2. It might have been 3-2. It might have been 3-2. At some point, Gerbigli got he got it together, and yeah. he put he put him down. But Ties wins his round. So in the second round, it's Pheromone versus Shiggies, and now they're playing speed duel links. Yeah, so kind of the duel links you might be more familiar with, basically. Yes. Pheromone brought Cosmos, and Shiggies brought uh, Live Twins. And from the outside looking in, you're like, okay, Live Twins, easy clap, wrong. Yeah, that was a matchup that was kind of interesting because most people agree that, like, Evil Twins or Live Twins are very good in Duel Links. Mm -hmm, they are. But um, Cosmos was a bit of, like, a bad matchup for them because... Yeah, it's a Dark Horse deck. The Cosmo Dark Destroyer and Forerunner as well, like, they can't be targeted. They are They can't be targeted and they're huge. And, like, you know, obviously the Twins kind of have a lot of targeting effects. And she was running Ballista Squad, mm -hmm. which is, like, a good removal card. But Except because she could targets. not target Dark Destroyer, it just got really... It was just and, overwhelming. And targeting effects are not just that. They're really bad against Cosmos since everything else can, like, switch out to mm -hmm. dodge targets. It's a whole yeah, problem. Yeah, Farm are running. Tin Cans are running. It, it's, it's a problem. Yeah, that was a 5-0. Yeah. That was actually a, a, the first, like, kind of just full-on sweep of the, of the Duel Links event. Um, and for what it's worth, I mean, I don't think it was a bad, like, 
they were friendly about it. It didn't seem yeah. like there was like bad blood or anything. But it's just the matchup was just that out of favor. It was the part of the event though where I was kind of like, oh, five games of this is a little bit tiring. Yeah, because it's like by the time someone's won three games of it, mm-hmm. it's like okay, like we get it. Cosmo beats like Live Twin. Do we need to watch it happen a fourth and a fifth time? Like. You know, obviously, the way that the point system and stuff worked, it was designed so that, like, maybe you could still salvage some points for your team in, like, yeah. game four and five, like, you know, maybe win a game or two. But I do think that with how long Duel Links kind of was dragging, it did not help. Like, it was it, it did help that it was a 5-0, like, mm-hmm. I guess, you know, for if you want your team to win. But because you kind of have to do, like, the five games regardless... It, the, you know. the I think the major issues, at least at this point with the event, the major issue I found was... We weren't allowed to have multiple decks or side or side cards in, so you were literally just watching the same thing over the and same over matchup again. Over and over. They just had different starting hands, and in such a polarized matchup, you it's know, just like you're just repeating bullying. Over yeah, and over. it was like it was like bullying. Now that's foreshadowing for later. <laughs> so in the next round, it's now it's my turn. I'm playing against fifth rate duelists. We're playing rush duel links with actual constructed decks this time. And I ran the uh, ultimate flag mechs, and she ran spellcasters, namely like Dark Magician Girl. And now this w- this was a much better showing of what Rush Duel Links is like. Yeah, two like very competent decks. Mm-hmm. We we ran we ran with skills. Yeah, the full set of our cards. We used our skills, and we even used legend cards. And legend cards, you can only have one of each type in your deck. That's monster, spell, and trap. And yeah, you know, and I think the the legend cards, especially on my end, were a huge reason on why. Spoiler alert: I did win my round. I actually, we had to, we had to play five times, and I won the first three games. And I think a part of me after the third win relaxed quite a bit because the thing is I knew I couldn't sweep her. I knew I couldn't get a 5-0. In rush duels, it's so hard to consistently win just because of the back and forth nature of it. Sometimes your hands are good. Sometimes they're not. I knew I would drop games. I probably dropped one more than I needed to, but uh, I won the first three and then fifth rate won the last two. It still wins me the round, but she did give get her, her team some points and the points they desperately needed because they lost so many. And I think this ultimately ended up being the difference maker for the results. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think your games are pretty cool. It was nice to see like kind of, uh, bespoke boss monsters that really like you know got rid of things i know yeah, you they, they did things. that one guy uh the the mech he was able to do a discard two monsters ace to breaker card, yeah. ace breaker and then you also had barrel dragon which didn't barrel go so dragon well. yeah so guys i mean we all know how barrel dragon works you flip a coin three times and if you get two or more heads you destroy it you destroy something right cool i missed six times in a row and I did the math on that that's like a 1.6 percent chance of that happening and i i had it it happened live yeah, it was pretty pretty awful, but um, <laughs> it did yeah. not stop me from winning the those first three games. Win. It's funny the game that you won was the first game that it got like finally like went in your favor. Oh, that was the, the one I game lost. You lost. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you won the games where it failed, and then the one game that you like where it worked, you lost. So. And and that time I got three heads, and I was like, whoa. And then I lost anyway. Yeah, Barrel Dragon just doesn't like you. Although I noticed it's twenty six hundred attack was a pretty big difference maker too. Yeah, just just that one point difference because I think. They've done a gr- good job of balancing the metagame of Rush Duels. They just haven't implemented new cards fast enough to make it interesting, in my opinion. Yeah. But speaking of interesting, let's move on to the last round. So at this point, Bacon Savers is certainly up. We're up by, was it 90-something points? Yeah, a lot over, of points. It might have been over 100. Regardless, uh, it's now Zeta versus Serenity, two very successful Duel Links players. If you've been around those circuits, you've probably seen their names once or twice winning and topping events. So Zeta brought the uh, new and improved Shiranui deck, which is quite strong. In fact, it just won the uh, KC Cup. But also, Serenity brought Tachyon. And uh, We actually talked about this in a previous uh, podcast, that yeah. the Tachyon deck is kind of the current... Men, but it's, many people agree it's like tier zero kind of strategy in Duel Links. It's certainly a menace. I had never seen this before. So and me seeing this in this tournament was like the first time I like got to watch the Tachyon deck in action. It's pretty insane. 
in especially in Serenity's hands when as we found out in post game interviews he actually had a pretty good idea of what matchup he was going into so i think any advantage zeta had playing shiranui was already neutralized just through forethought and planning i think that he that ice dragon's prison was like him knowing yeah it that ice dragon prison kept crushing the shiranui boards left and right see the, the way this was situated Sarandi needed to win six games in order for his team to win the tournament as for a comeback from, you know, a comeback victory. Zeta only needed to win three. Yeah, so it was looking good. Yeah, it was, so because, yeah, he had to win half as many times. But, and I saw this later, and I was watching some of the um, peop, some people's streams back later. I heard Sarandi say during, a, he's watching my game with fifth rate say, I'm pretty confident I can win 80% of my games. When they saw the point discrepancy, he said, I can do this. Yeah, and he did. And boy, did he. It honestly felt like an execution. Yeah, so this is basically just a massacre of, you know, the kind of galaxy tachyon, like just level 8 dragon deck. Just bullying. Just, I mean, really. Despite any hindrances, it was it could push it through. It just pushes through. It gets, it's so consistent. It, it gets re- so much it off one card. It recovers so much. It gets so much value out of every card. Makes huge Xyz monsters, and then they've got a counter trap that's like usable from hand, and it's really insane. And it got to a point where it just was like, even though Shiranui uh, apparently is seen as like it's, that the, deck arguably is sick the second too. best deck, and it's really strong. It was just outclassed. Yeah, completely and utterly. So, so it was kind of <laughs> depressing though because it meant like, so the the previous rounds had to be like were five games each. Yes. This one went until the a, a team got over 200 points. Yeah. So it could have ended in as short as three if, like, Zeta had won three in a row. Mm-hmm. But it also could go as long as eight, which it did. Yeah, and with so, the full nine yards. So um, Serenity won six games. Zeta managed to scrape two out, but it was not enough. And so... Uh, so Team Ghost Beef wins the tournament. And really demoralizing. <laughs> yeah, it killed me because I'm. I'm a, I had to, we had to stream the event the whole way through, even when we weren't playing, and it it was painful to watch as the po- as Serrani's team their points matched ours, passed us up, and then kept and then going. Just, yeah, it really it was a, it's a bit of a shame. I think it was a bit of a showcase of uh, why the Galaxy Tachyon deck. <sighs> Konami, might y'all got to do something about that. Might need to get that. hit a little bit because <laughs> like, uh, that deck is, y'all got to do something about that. <laughs> At least by like speed duel standards, I just think it's it's kind of insane. Um, yeah, certainly. What it just what it's able to put out, how easy it's able to recover, the and power of the skill. I think if uh, it kind of reminded me a bit of the old uh, Zodiac True was that Zodiac True Draco format. Yeah, a little. Where where it's like, oh, True Draco is an annoying deck to play against too, but it was really Zoo's format, right? Yeah, it's so. It's kind of unfortunate, but you did win your round. I did win my round, and that qualified me for to win my prize. Which, uh, for winning your round, you you could get a giant card. I think in Macedon it was a yeah. I get an Ash Blossom, a giant Ash Blossom card, and I can get a giant Blue Eyes. This like to be my first giant card. Ever. Me too. I don't, yeah, we have these uh, oversized cards or whatever these are called, like the large cards. These are like the twenty six inch ones, mm-hmm. but the giant cards are like a whole different scale. So I'm excited. I don't know where we'll put them up but once we get them you guys will see them mm, i'm gonna flex mine they'll be on this podcast they'll be like right here on the table i wonder if someone will like take a trade for a red eyes one i, I like red eyes more. i don't know if there is a red eyes one hey, well, someone eyes. needs to someone needs to make one so that was a really cool event and then also the uds happened jesse cotton won that um, was a crazy event especially if you uh if you like snake eyes dittos yeah a lot of players playing the snake eye deck this is just tcg again by the way so um, a lot of people playing Snake Eyes. Jesse Cotton came out on top. It kind of cemented for a lot of people the idea that Snake Eyes, like a tier zero deck, or Fire King Snake Eye, Pure Snake Eye. Whether or not that's actually true, I think remains to be seen. There still are more events to come. We've got, we had YCS Costa Rica. That was a 3v3 mm-hmm. event that was also happening this past weekend. That was won by uh, Pac's team. Pac and uh, his team, I forget all three of their names, but they were, I think, all playing Snake Eye. It did, it did sound like they were all playing Snake Eye. Yeah, and they won. And then, like, this upcoming weekend, there's YCS Las Vegas, another 3v3 event. And if it looks like, you know, Fire King Snake Eye is dominant there as it well. It sounds like it's the deck, yeah. Then that's the kind of proof that it's, like, a tier zero deck. Mm-hmm. Now, what that means... It's a nice headline. I don't know. I mean, maybe that means Konami hits it sooner. 
I don't know the in the UDS it felt like be, because they were all picking the same deck they weren't able to side some of the more potent cards against Snake Eye because it would affect themselves, too. Yeah, it would be kind of tougher to use, like, Dimension Shifter right. as a Snake Eye player. Now, that does it may, it may, that might repeat itself at YCSs, too, but there is a chance, because, uh, you know, I've been playing a little bit on Master Duel, running Snake Eyes against non-Snake Eyes decks, people are able to just, they're freer to run, like, Snake Eyes hate because it won't yeah. affect them. I mean, so there was a little bit of controversy. I know, like, it came out that the top four on day two was, like, open deck list. And so there was some controversy around that. Open deck list in the sense that, like, so imagine, you know, playing in a top cut of an event and you get to see everybody's deck list. And they all get to see yours before the event begins. So you can, like, memorize whatever your opponent's tech cards, hand Mm -hmm. trap choices, board breakers, all of that. Like, you get to know kind of what that is. Some people sort of liked that. Some people did not. I saw Ryan Yu on Twitter was pretty outspoken against it. He just thought that it kind of took away a lot of the um, challenge of having to play around cards. If you just know that your opponent's not running Nibiru, then you don't have to play around Nibiru now. Yeah. Or if you know that they're not running you know, Droll, then you don't have to care what order you search things in. And it's stuff like that. Something like, to me, I understand why I did it, because certain players were on feature matches, and so th- their uh, deck choices were revealed early, and other players weren't in feature matches. So it might have been a little unfair if your deck got featured and people could kind of parse your deck list. But, you know, deck building is a very large aspect of Yu-Gi-Oh!, and a part of that is your opponent's never supposed to know what's in your deck when you sit down to play. They're just not supposed exactly. to know. Exactly. I, I don't like the idea of revealing the deck list, Mm-mm. like open deck for top four. I think that, uh, I mean, I know that there is the issue of the feature match thing. Like, maybe someone might know some of your list. But even in those cases, just being on a feature match does not reveal your entire list, at least. And it's just kind of a consequence mm-hmm. of the medium. Like, if we're going to have feature matches, it's just, it's going to have to happen to someone. Yeah. But I still think that open deck lists kind of... I won't go so far as to say it's, like, compromising competitive integrity because, I mean, everybody got access to all the lists. But it's just more like it does feel like it's a bit of an, a, a nerf to creative deck building. Because uh, if, if, if you deck build with, like, one particular weakness in mind, let's say you ran only one Promethean Princess in your deck. You know, that's something you don't want your opponent to know. You don't want your opponent to just know if I banish that Promethean Princess, that interaction is gone from their game. They cannot regain it. Yeah, the one example that uh, that came up was actually that um, one of the players in the top four was... Um, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, um, Andre Torres, um, one of the players in the top four went with a build that focused less on hand traps. I believe this is who it was. Focused less on hand traps and more on board breakers. Mm -hmm. And that was like a a conscious choice for the specific event. And so, you know, if you maybe choose to run less of like, you know, Drone Lockbird, Ash Blossom, Nibiru, whatever, and instead go for like going second cards like Evenly Matched or Forbidden Droplets or Dark Lord No Mores or whatever, then... um, the idea is that your opponent, when they go first against you, they're going to still be wary of hand traps because they think you might have them. Turns out you don't, so they might make slightly less optimal plays. And right. then when you go second, you are able to just break their board more easily now. And so you can also go blind second, where like right. you know you win the dice roll and still choose to go second. And now they have to kind of play a guessing game. So there's a lot of a kind of a, a mental mind game sort of thing going on with that. But now that everybody knew his deck list, they just knew, oh, I'll just go first against this guy and not care about any hand traps because he's not running any. I know that for yeah, a fact. I, I can just go full combo. And now I can just kind of plan for, you know, stopping just evenly or stopping just, you know, whatever kind of lightning storm, whatever the go second card is. And so it kind of felt like he might have been disproportionately affected by that. So. It's like, and it's, and it's, you know, it just, it's the fact that you can just know. Yeah. And. You give us a game of knowledge. It's a it's a game of knowledge. If you know, like, you, there's so many things in Yu Gi Oh you don't know, but the moment that you do know something, it's like significantly, you know, like imagine right. trying to beat a Jesse Cotton while he knows what's in your hand. It's like impossible. I like, guess it's, it's just not going to happen. Like uh, you know, I've 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 been on I've on record multiple times saying the way Jesse's mind works scares me, and it really does. In a format like that, I could never bet against him. It's part of why the um 
power of cards like, you know, Triple Tactics Talents is always kind of brought into question, like whether or not that card should be banned or something. Because some people say it should because of its power to, like, hand rip you and give them the knowledge of your hand. And Konami's been on a bit of a tirade lately hitting cards that allow that same thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a pointer of the Red Lotus, yep. Trap Dust You Long Ago, like all those cards, that stuff gets hit because it's like, Someone knowing your deck list or knowing what's in your hand in the top tables of these events, like, that's it. Like, like they might argue, well, maybe you'll be more careful about activating a monster effect on your opponent's turn, but that's unavoidable. You will. Yeah, Mario, you, if you don't activate an, opponent, do uh, an so. effect on your opponent's turn, you lose. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a, your kind of bit of UDS, we'll call it drama, sure. But, um, yeah, Jesse ended up winning, which is really cool. Oh, wait, what deck did he use? Uh, yeah, uh, it was like this Fire King Snake Eye. Oh, yeah, Fire King so, Snake Eyes. Like 14 of the 16 players. Yeah, I think that like 13 or 14 of them were using that. So I think there were there were other decks at this event. There's one Cash Tira I saw. There was Cash Tira, Fluanderies, and Branded. And Branded. So yep. I think like, yeah. Mm -hmm. was, I think that was like about all the diversity, diversity that you got. <laughs> now again, we'll see. Maybe this changes next weekend now that more people are prepared for Snake Eye or Fire King Snake Eye. There might be some If nothing else, you're prepared for the mirror. Yeah, so if you're going to an event, it sounds like that's the the matchup to know. Anywho, a little bit of other Yu-Gi-Oh! news has happened in the past week. Some smaller things yeah. we saw. Um, what is the, the EX art book? Is that what it's... There's like a new Yu-Gi-Oh! art book. I forget what it's they, called. I forget the name of the art book as well. It's not that important what it's called because it's not releasing in the TCG. But I think it releases today, but yesterday for you guys watching... In, in Japan, so expect to see a bunch of new OCG arts of a lot of your favorite archetypes. Yeah, I'm gonna take a look, see if I can find um, the exact name of it because I want to. It's like the Yu-Gi-Oh. Man, I just searched it yesterday. I can't remember it today. Yeah, I know. I'm so upset. But basically, it's an art book that kind of features different archetypes that have gotten like lore stories and stuff, mm. and you get to see some. You know, different sides, those monsters. Um. Yeah, lots of annotations. We, we've seen some reveals already. Like, uh, we've seen a lot of live twin artwork in there, or evil twin. I don't know what you call it, archetype, honestly. But uh, we've seen a lot of evil twin artwork, and you even see that they seem they seem to exist in the same world as IP Mascarena. Really? It, may, it makes some sense. There's, there's this kind of, like, futuristic, cybery aesthetic going on with a lot of cards so there's a rare, very real chance they exist in the same world which might also mean they exist in the same world as the s-force and many other archetypes honestly yeah so that's a cool thing it's happening um there's also a few new um promo cards from the valuable book ex4 there's yeah another one. There's like OC now that's the lore sense. book so Oh, is that like that's the book that's got the lore in it? So yeah, the, we were talking about the art book before, but the valuable book is what usually has lore stories. Okay, well you get a, a new uh, summon skull retrain in there mm -hmm. for the cool. uh, Yugi's gold sarcophagus deck. Yeah, and a new Ubel card, another fusion monster that comes in there. Like I have, I haven't read it yet. This it's called the Spirit of Ubel or Phantom of Ubel or Phantom of yeah, Ubel. Phantom of Ubel. So um, that's a new thing that's in the OCG. We'll see when that sort of stuff even comes to TCG, if at all. Also, a few other little miscellaneous Yu-Gi-Oh! tidbits. I saw that they are making some new Yu-Gi-Oh! accessories. Mm -hmm. There is the uh, desk accessories. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've seen these. So these are basically these, like, things that you can just put on your desk. There's, like, a... Uh, let me see if I can find it. There's a... Multi case that's just got like Yami Yugi sitting on a Millennium like kind of puzzle box. You can just put store stuff in your box. Staring into your There's eyes a all day. Dark Magician memo stand, a Seto Kaiba sticky note stand. Nice. Um, a Blue Eyes White Dragon pin stand, a smartphone stand with Joey, and a stamp stand with Red Eyes Black Dragon. That would upset me because since in the United States we don't really use stamps, so I even though it has Red Eyes on it, I wouldn't have a use for it. Yeah, I'll put up the picture of that so you guys can see what that's about. But that's an OCG product. I would not mind importing over here. Speaking though. of the OCG, uh, they have some a new. Uh, they have replicas of the Millennium Puzzle and the Millennium Key available as prizes at amusement parks across Japan. Wait, really? Oh, yes. Oh, I think I, I saw this this morning. They have like they have kind of like renders of them. Oh, okay. Now they don't go into detail about like how you get them, what like, and what exactly are they prizes for? But uh, I want one. 
That's all I that's all I care about. I, I want one. There's some new products from Loungefly that are exclusive to GameStop. It's a um Yu-Gi-Oh backpack, cross body bag, and an enamel keychain. So you have this cool backpack, it's like a mini bag. Okay. Fifty dollars. A bit what? pricey. A Millennium Puzzle crossbody bag for fifty five dollars. The Millennium pu- the le- Millennium Puzzle as a crossbody is a smart except I like that. And then um, an enamel keychain that's just ten ninety nine. So. Oh, that's pretty nice. Yeah, so some cool Yu Gi Oh stuff you can get your hands on. Mm-hmm. Sounds fun. I the fact that this is a GameStop is pretty cool. Just somehow GameStop staying alive somehow. Yeah, just through through accessories, really more so than selling games. Yeah, more so than games. It seems like it's a lot of accessories. Okay, so I think that's all the Yu-Gi-Oh! I had. Is there anything Same. that maybe I might have missed? Nope, you we guys? talked about everything I saw. So let us know if we did. Um, cool. So, any other card game stuff then? Yeah, I found some things. There's stuff happening? Yeah, theft. Uh-oh. But this time it's not Pokemon cards. Okay. So, Seattle police arrest suspect and recover about $40,000 worth of stolen Magic the Gathering cards. Oh, boy. It feels like not a week goes by that we don't get one of these stories. Right. They just can't stop. So, Seattle police have arrested a 28-year-old man who stole about 40000 worth of Magic Gathering cards from a warehouse where he temporarily worked. Officers were called to the businesses in the 5100 block of Leary Avenue. We don't, we don't know where that is. After a manager noticed substantial discrepancies in their stock of Magic cards. So, these cards were accounted for, and he just lifted them. Yeah. The suspect's contract had ended days prior, so they thought that they were going to get off scot-free with this. The business the business found cards similar to the missing inventory being sold from Washington through an online marketplace. So he was trying to sell them legitimately, but he got them illegitimately. An envelope from an order through the marketplace revealed the suspect's name and matched his address. Seattle police served a warrant at the suspect's home, and detectives were able to recover the majority of the stolen cards. They have a picture of just uh, of some of the cars they found. Oh just, wow! I'm a, they don't say like what set these are from, but if I had to guess, these are probably like advanced copies of these cars that weren't supposed to be out on the market yet. Yeah, I guess they're from a store, so maybe they'd gotten there like earlier that week. It's so interesting how you know when people will steal these cards, they always. They're always so predictable with, like, how they end up getting caught. Like, it's kind of mm-hmm. like, let me just steal these cards and then just sell them on eBay from, like, my local location. Like, yeah, guys, don't use your... I, I, I know the point of this is don't steal, but if, like, if you do, for the love of God, don't, like, don't take something illegitimately and try and sell it legitimately. Yeah, keep <laughs> keep being illegitimate like, is what Alec is saying. I'm just saying. Like, this, no, but I, I do think it's, it's like, you know, if you steal something in, like, you know, New York City and then you, like, sell it from New York City and stuff, like, it's, of course you're going to get, like, get caught. So it's not that, um you know, stealing is a good thing, but it's just funny that, you know, when people do it, it feels like they probably go to, like, great length to try to take the cards, and then the moment they're trying to, like, offload them and get the money from it, mm-hmm. it's like all the logic just goes out the door and... You know, but I have a, re- I, have a re- I think I have a theory on why that is. Because mm-hmm. I think any card game player knows how hard it is to sell cards, how to get the value you want, how to get the price that you want, and find people willing to pay the amount that you want for your cards. Right, yeah. So I think this, this guy is like, okay, I stole all these cards, so what do I do with them? There's no one person willing to drop 40 grand for a bunch of cards. You're yeah, so you have to, to kind of like, I guess, disseminate it some and sell it on eBay and different places like that. Well, I'm glad that this person got caught, though. Yeah, I, I just wish that all these people getting caught would eventually just drive the point home. Stop stealing cards. Yeah, I mean, stop stealing them, A, because it's bad, and B, because it feels like it's hard to actually do anything with them after, in, in any immediate way. Of all things to be stealing, you're stealing cards. Yeah, so, um, anywho, there's another magic story that I saw. There's a Fallout Commander release. Oh, I don't know if you are, you know about the game Fallout. Um, one of Magic's most devastating cards returns with the Fallout Commander release. It's uh, this artifact card that lets you like search any color mana. Mm-hmm. That's good. But um, anywho, yeah. So um, Magic: The Gathering's mega popular Universes Beyond collection has already traveled the cosmos with Doctor Who, waged battle across Middle Earth in search of the One Ring, and dropped in on a few rounds of Fortnite. I didn't know about that. What? 
Apparently, there's like a Fortnite. Must have been or an there older was one. a Fortnite it thing. Must have been before I. Well, anyways, started now playing. the original trading card game arrives in the wasteland with four Fallout themed decks for the multiplayer commander format, along with some amazing reprints and alternate art treatments waiting inside. So, uh, the biggest reveal is the return of Ravages of War, an older magic card that takes the nuclear option by destroying every land on the table, even your own. That's sick. <laughs> There's also a fancy new Sol Ring, always good for two colorless mana. It's a staple. That comes emblazoned with the Pip Boy himself. Oh, that'll be popular. So, here's Ravages of War with the art. Um, Destroy all lands. And Such a white the card. Sol Ring. Yep. So, got some Fallout imagery on there. That's pretty cool. I mean, I don't know too much about Fallout. I remember I had a family member who played it a lot. So... I'm looking at the box though for the commander deck, and uh, oh, it's dog meat. No, that's his name. The dogs, dog meat. Dog meat. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah. So you get four of these decks. That's so like, I think I've said this a million times. It's so wild to me that like they release four decks at a time. One hundred cards each. A hundred, like four one hundred card commander decks, just pre constructed. You can buy at your card shop. It's like you know the Yu Gi Oh. We get like a structure deck every. Some months. Mm-hmm. And, like... Magic just kind of pumps them out. And with Magic, it's, like, every three months, there's, like, four new Commander decks. Also, these Commander decks are expensive. Yeah, This one, at least according to, like, the site, is approximately $60. I believe you can usually get a set of them, a, a four, for, like, one, four, 150 somewhere around there. Would you want that? Me? No. Well, no, like, would a person want... For because I mean, I thought commander is like one ofs, right? It is one ofs, but some people like to ch- get each, each, oh, you know, a set of oh, a set of all four of them. Yeah. I thought you meant a set of like four of the same one, okay? No, oh, no, 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 yeah. So you can get like all four together for maybe like 150 bucks. That, that, that's, not, that's not a bad deal, it's not a bad deal, but it's still a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It, so that's the main thing is like that's a lot of that's a hefty price for like a starter deck structure or whatever. Like, a I mean, deck. they, the, you know. And Matt like Wizards would argue deck. that these are ready to play right out the box, and so you're paying for the convenience of not having a deck build or gather cards. I guess when you frame it that way, maybe it's all right. But I mean, anyone who's played Commander format knows. I mean, they're not really ready to play right out of the box. I mean, they, 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 they are they will, playable. They are playable, but there are many upgrades and changes you can typically make to these decks. Right. Okay. Well, anyways, it's out now, so yeah, it's out. It's out. It's you out. like Fallout, and I, I, and sadly, uh, well, I think it's it's gonna be out on March eighth. Oh, right? I guess coming out. Yeah, it's coming out soon. But uh, yeah, I was actually never that big on Fallout. I've played Fallout games, and what it, uh, it's kind of like the style to Fallout. I don't care for. Okay. The um the UI I don't like very much. Their 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 way of doing first person I don't like that much either. Yeah, I'm, I've I've realized I'm just not a very big fan of Fallout. I understand why everyone else is, but I, not me. Not a Fallout guy. Well, that's okay. There are plenty of people who are, and even if you're not, it's all right because I'm sure Magic's got another collaboration just around the corner. They for do. You. They do. I'm very excited for Marvel and Final Fantasy. Cool. So that's my Magic story. So I don't have another magic story, but I do have a Pokemon story. Oh, surprise, surprise. And this one kind of caught me off guard because in Yu-Gi-Oh! we hate this, but in, in Pokemon it's a little bit different. Okay, what do we hate? So it's, the headline says, Pokemon TCG players are obsessed with this amazing miscut card. So this is another one of those Dexterito articles about a Reddit post. Like, I'm not going to get into the, like, the... Yeah. The census Bring all trash makes. trash onto the podcast. But anyway, again, I see. so in a Reddit post, uh, Pokemon TCG player excellent, excellent fate underscore phase ninety one eighty two. That's a username if I ever heard one. Shared an image of a very miscut and off center card with the caption "worst cut card I've, I've ever gotten." Sharing in a latter comment that it was not looking to see, they was not looking to sell the piece. As pointed out by a keen-eyed reader in the comments, the card shown in the image does have an alignment dot in the bottom left-hand corner. All right, let's it's, see the picture. Where, where's the? Because I, 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 it's hard to follow. Like that's true. You need to see it. I gotta open up the original and show you the picture. Because uh, I saw this and it, th- it made me think of how uh, some of our recent Yu-Gi-Oh cards have been. Here's our miscut. Oh, okay, miscut. Ditto. Okay, cool. I'll put it on. I'll put it on screen. 
So people are infatuated with this? Yeah. Uh, turns out um, that actually makes it more rare and valuable. I mean, that's and sometimes they the want to get it graded with, now. That's sometimes the case with Yu-Gi-Oh, where like heavily miscut stuff will be like seen as a little more. So I should go back and valuable. grade those gold series cards. Maybe. I will say this. Uh, I think it probably speaks maybe to Pokemon's print quality that like that's seen as a huge deal because in Yu-Gi-Oh we are more used to oddly cut cards. I, like, mean, I feel like they pop up a little more in Yu-Gi-Oh, but I don't know. I don't follow Pokemon enough to. Because I was just surprised people were talking about the uh, estimated worth and how rare and cool this was. And I was like, they mess up our cards all the time and we're never happy. Yeah. Hmm. Speaking of Pokemon, they have announced a Pokemon Presents for next week. It's on February 27th. It's going to be a sort of, I guess, it's kind of the Pokemon equivalent to a Nintendo Direct. Oh, that's and it's before the pod. So that's yeah, good. so before we record the podcast, we'll be able to talk about everything. There's a lot of uh, speculation around what will be shown at this Pokemon mm-hmm. Presents. Will we be getting, you know, a Gen 5 remake, like black and white remake? Some people think that's what they'll announce. Don't even know if I want that. Uh, will we be getting, you know, Gen 1 and 2 games like on the Nintendo Switch eShop or something like that? We could use those. Yeah, I think people want Gen 3 is the one that they want. Because I think that they've put 1 and 2 on. Are they already on there? Already, yeah, I, I think I this think. put, since Nintendo refuses to, um, like, make, they, they hate, they you know, they hate emulation. They refuse to give us games in a, in a way that we can play them forever. I think pushing those co- those games up onto the latest eShop would just be beneficial. Yeah, I know a lot of people are expecting something with gold and silver. Even um, though red, red and blue should just be free to play. So I'm going to actually read this article because it seems like it might know a little bit more than I do. I don't know exactly what's on the eShop and all that. But thankfully, Kotaku, our friends over there, do. We have friends over there? No. Oh, but, okay. Um, so they say, Pokemon Black and White uh, are next in line for remakes if the company keeps going in chronological order. Um, given like Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl releasing in 2021. I like those games. Yeah, so those are pretty good. I know they didn't get as great a reception, but I, I like them. I, play, I played them more than I played Sword and Shield. Um, some people also think that a Let's Go game set based in Johto could be the what they get instead. So you know they're like Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu, yeah, Pikachu and, Let's and, Go and Eevee. Eevee. Some people think that it'll be that instead. Um, hmm. What? So what do we think of each of those things? About so so the, a Gen Five remake first Gen Five remake black and white I'm mixed on it because that Next. was yeah it came out when I was over Pokemon and the first time you were over Pokemon I mean yeah one of the times I was over Pokemon but I was over Pokemon when when Black One and Two came out and I I just I was not enchanted by the designs at the time it's and, interesting you oh, sorry go ahead but and. As an adult, though, I actually kind of like their Pokemon designs now, but I don't have a connection to them because I didn't play you the game. Play them, so this would be a good opportunity for you to play them. Yeah, maybe see what see what it's all about. But I'll say people this: people say they were bad. I, okay, so black and white, I think, were the most like. I think the Pokemon community really like did not do well by those games. Like, and mm-hmm. I say that because black and white retroactively have been seen as like. Someone argued the like last good Pokemon games, or some would even say peak Pokemon. Wow. But um, what made Black and White so special was that they um, they had 150 new Pokemon, and that was all those in the regional decks. Right. So these are the first Pokemon games where you would not encounter a Zubat in a cave, or like a Geodude, or in a tunnel, or whatever. And so it was 150 new Pokemon. It was a controversial decision because I think from the Pokemon company's perspective. They were kind of trying to like break free of the shackles of Pikachu's always the mascot, and you know you catch Abra everywhere and all that stuff. They slapped all the Gen Oneers right in the face. Yeah, and so they were kind of trying to do something new. And the games also came pretty late in the DS's lifespan, mm-hmm. so they were pushing the DS graphics to the limit with some really creative kind of like three D sprite work sort of looks. It was sort of emulating three D sprite work, but you know like. They weren't perfect games. Um, I think that the timing that they came out and the fact that people thought that the designs were really bad, like, why is there a Pokemon that's like a pair of keys or like an ice cream cone or whatever? They got a lot of flack for that. 
But I really liked black and white. I thought they were fun. Yeah. I've I've grown to really like a lot of the black and white Pokemon designs. And then I found out that in black and white, too, they had the, uh, like, champion tournament or whatever. Yeah. Like a world tournament type situation. Yeah. The black and white, too, were fun. They uh, It was the first time that we got, like, a two instead of a, mm-hmm. like, platinum type of game. And they basically, like, it was, like, a time skip in the region. And they reordered the order that, you like, you do the gyms and the towns and stuff. And kind of shipped it up to the Elite Four a little bit, like the champion. So, I don't know. I thought that it was fine. Like, I think Black and White, I would like a remake of them. I wonder if they would go for, like, just, I guess, I guess they'd probably do the 3D style that they use in most of the games right. today. But it'd be cool if they could kind of go back to, like, the 3D sprite work. Seems unlikely. It, but. It, it feels like we've just, we've just passed that right up, and we are not going back under any circumstances. Right. Now, now about the Let's Go games. Yeah, what do we think of that? I played so, a little Let's Go, like, EV. I think. I never played the Let's Go series. Um, it, it didn't really appeal to me, just the general concept of them. They're more about, like, throwing the balls to catch the Pokemon. Yeah, so it was like playing Pokemon Go, but a console version of it, I, I guess. Mm-hmm. But, um... I don't even know what Pokemon you choose this time. I think Pikachu and Eevee were pretty solid picks for the first one. They're very one. iconic Gen 1s. Like, I don't know that Gen 2 has. Mm. I heard like a rumor, it wasn't with like Wooper and Togepi? <laughs> um, yeah, I was like, I don't... Well, okay, I'll say this, I'll say this, I'll say this. Togepi might be a good one, because po- Togepi was pretty iconic in the anime. So like, much, you're going to have the little Togepi walking behind you, always like 15 feet back, because his feet are incredibly small. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but like... Oh, it's going to roll on its side. Yeah, I know. But I mean, like, Togepi could be one from Gen 2. Wooper, though. No, Wooper. Your payoff is a quagsire. <laughs> yeah. But then it's like, well, so what... That's crazy. Like, I actually like Wooper and Quagsire, but that just sounds so, so it's silly. Like what, what does Gen 2 have as, like, iconic? Espeon and Umbreon, that could be actually a pretty fun you duo. You bring back but Eevee? But then, yeah, then they're not, like, cute and small anymore. I mean, they're still cute and small, but you know what I mean. I guess it, Togepi and Eevee, you just, we just mix Pikachu all together. Maybe you start with a Pichu. It's, it's Pichu and Eevee. Gen 2 was known for, like, introducing a lot of the baby Pokemon. Who had no purpose. I don't even know. I mean, it's for flavor. It's <laughs> cute. Iggly Buff and Pichu and, like, those sorts of things. It so. could be interesting if they did just pick, like, baby Pokemon. So maybe it could be something like a Leg Kid and uh, Ma- Magby. Magby, yeah. That might be too cool. They want to get something cuter, I guess. I don't know. I, I would not mind them being Pokemon Let's Go games. I just don't think I would play them, though. Like, like I, I played Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu or mm-hmm. whatever. Not my thing. Um, it was a Kanto remake, which already wasn't like all that exciting for me. And then they it was very dumbed down, so to speak. Like, I mean, the difficulty was very easy. You got XP just for like catching Pokemon. Like, you got XP for everything. EXP all. <laughs> you, you walk two steps. Experience. And I don't. And again, I'm not a hater. To be clear, I'm not a hater of, like, the new EXP system in Pokemon games. I just felt that these games were easy for an entirely different reason, and it didn't mm-hmm. engage me very much. Um, so, probably one of those two things. People want Gen 3 in the eShop. That seems to be what it is now that I'm reading. Maybe they'll announce a new Pokken tournament. That'd be cool. I think they were definitely going to get updates on, like, stuff like Pokemon Go, Pokemon Unite, Pokemon oh, Sleep. Oh, sure. Pokemon Sleep. For... I, don't, I, would, I want to meet someone who plays Pokemon Sleep. Well, you probably wouldn't because I'd be asleep. But you still have to interact with the app. Yeah, right. In the daytime. They wake up, they use the app, so, yeah, and they go and right they go back, back to sleep. sleep. Yeah. So, um, it'll be cool. You know, we'll talk about it here in the podcast as well. See what's... Um, what's to see? I think that the last possible thing that you could expect... Because it's not like we're going to get a... Uh, I don't think that we're going to be like Gen 11 or whatever... 10. I doubt We're it. We're not getting a new gen. But there might be a chance at like a Legends Arceus sequel. That could be kind of... What would they even do? People like Legends Arceus, so I thought that they might... Like the, I do think the gameplay style worked out better than uh, I think expected. I just don't know what you do beyond it. Because they're, they're already kind of rewriting the Pokemon lore with this ancient Pokemon story. Do we just 
tell an ancient Pokemon story in a different region. That'd be my guess. Just that take a different region. Sense. That actually does make some talk sense. About some of their ancient yeah, no, stuff. I could see that. Whatever their history Interact is. Interact with a primal Groudon, a primal Kyogre, or maybe you find the first Mew or something. I don't know. Yeah, so that's the Pokemon uh, Presents. It'll be cool. I'm excited for it. I do have one more uh, TCG story. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, but only because you keep bringing it up that I bother to save this. Okay. So, Fantasy Flight reveals Star Wars Unlimited Spark of the Rebellion Weekly Play Kit. Ah, uh, so, so you are interested in, in I'm not. Star Wars. I'm not. Only because you keep bringing it to the pod. Well, I gotta try to bring the pod, you know, the card game news, man. That's what, and it's the only reason I'm mentioning this, guys. The only reason. So, anyway, Spark of the Rebellion is a weekly play kit. So, uh, it's an organized play kit. So it comes with eight weeks worth of prizing, essentially. Oh, so this is for card shops. Well, I mean, I guess you could probably, maybe you can get it if you're like a normal person. Yeah, like that's the thing; they don't necessarily say specifically that a a card shop has to have it. Because really, I, th- I think if you and a group of friends got your hands on this thing, you can run your own little season. I'm a, I'm assuming it's for card, it's jobs, for card right? shops. But here's the thing that get that's kind of weird. Uh, it's only made to support up to eight players, so like that feels like a like a, a pretty small scene. Maybe they're assuming that's how big scenes are going to be. Yeah, maybe that's like, hey, this is the best we could hope. No, I think that probably the the more accurate thing is that because this is kind of how you go sneak peek kits work. Like you usually your shop gets more than like one sneak peek kit. True. So like you know you might get like because I think one sneak peek kit. Is for sixteen people, mm-hmm. and so like two, is like you know we just double that. I don't know if that's how it still works, but like back when I was at any point involved in like a card shops kind of OTS scene, that's how it was. So maybe it's like one kit is for eight, and so your your shop just orders them based on how many, what the anticipated interest. That will does be. make sense. That so like if you're a small sense. card shop that already doesn't really like handle mini game scenes. Like in large numbers, and you probably just get like one because you're assuming like, oh, it might only be eight people. But then maybe you get two or three depending on how big your scene is. But I do, I do think it's important that Star Wars Unlimited is acknowledging that organized play is a is a mandatory thing that every card game kind of needs if it's going to have a, a a local scene. And pretty much from the jump, these weekly play kits are um, they're gonna hit stores. Um, or Star Wars Unlimited hits stores on March 8th, and they will have organized play support. So if you and a group of friends are interested in this game, and it seems you only need about eight of you. Uh, only sh- need about eight. Yeah, your local shop has reason enough. How many adults do you enough. know with eight friends? Exactly. <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, it's, I think it'd be, it's more for card shops. So. Yeah. That's cool, though. I mean, Star Wars Unlimited, it's it's coming out, man. Like, have, you, have your thoughts on it changed? Like, no. You're still not... Mm-mm. Not at all interested in playing. I don't want to play. Okay. What would change your mind? So if I, anything. I, I am a card artwork kind of guy. If I see a card that I want, maybe I'll try it. But so far, I've been safe. I'm so good. far, you, well, how many have you seen so far, though? Have I've seen, I've seen a handful. We keep bringing it to the pod. Okay. But I haven't seen any characters or anything. So you're not going to like about. buy a pack out of curiosity when it comes no. to that? No. Under okay. no circumstances. Speaking of buying packs out of curiosity, this is actually a little sort of Yu-Gi-Oh update. I, so our local Walmart has actually started stocking Yu-Gi-Oh packs again. Mm-hmm. This is a really big deal because for some of you guys are like, okay, what's the big, what's the point? Who cares? Like, what are you talking about? It's been years. Our local Walmart has not stocked Yu-Gi-Oh packs in, I want to say something close to about almost 10 years. Mm-hmm. Now we've had like Walmarts that are, you know, maybe 20 minutes out or so where you can get the packs. Uh, and that's usually where we would do like the Larry in the Holes for Walmart. But our kind of local drive. Walmart, our the local closest Walmart, one. It's like five minutes away, has Yu Gi Oh packs now. It's a pretty big deal. They don't have loads of them, but they are stocking them again. And so I have taken to purchasing a few Yu Gi Oh products, um, you know, a couple packs every time I'm at Walmart because I'm, uh, I'm a peasant. I shop at Walmart. Apparently that makes you Disgusting. bad person. I don't know. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I do shop at Walmart. So um, whenever I'm getting like groceries or whatever, I've been grabbing packs. And the track record's been really good. Yeah. Every what? time that like we've bought a couple packs, like at any time from the card shop, you pull at least we an pull ultra. some good stuff. And some of the stuff that I pulled at Walmart, just on my own, has been really good too. So um, like yesterday, I pulled a low. Yep. And you got a Poplar. Yep, low and Poplar out of six packs. Yeah, and before that, uh, I got 
another low from like a pack. Like mm-hmm. I've been getting some really lucky pulls. Like you know, there's something to be said the like the blister strategy. Yeah, the man. blister strategy. Maybe it's fine. I will say this: it's not like I would recommend everybody go out and you know run and buy a bunch of blisters. But Konami would like that. Yeah, be Konami's own little sales advocate here. Hey, as um, a Yu-Gi-Oh YouTuber, you kind of are. Yeah, inadvertently. So <laughs> I think that um, I I think the key to it though is like you buy like two or three. You don't buy a lot. Yep. You don't don't invent. I I. For me, I kind of let go of the idea of, like, I'm buying a full box or several boxes and hoping for profit. And instead, it's just, like, I'm already spending X amount on groceries, whatever. So, I'll just add, like, five, ten more bucks onto that it's in packs. And I don't like, care what I pull. It's the difference between being, like, someone with a gambling addiction and just being a casual gambler. Ah, just gamble a little bit. Just casually you gamble know. at the gas station, the yeah, scratchies or yeah, something. Yeah, it's like, it's not like you're buying... 30 scratch offs. It's just, you happen to be at the gas station, you buy one because you're here, you know? Yeah, so there's a cool update on that, not really related to any of these card games, but just you get related. I do have a couple non card game related stories. Do you? Yes. Okay. So they announced a Borderlands movie. And I, and I don't know hmm. if you're uh, too familiar with Borderlands. It's this, uh, pre- it's, a, it's a pretty popular Gearbox title. It known for its kind of irreverent characters and uh, kind of wacky storytelling. Yeah, I played like one of the Borderlands games it's, in high school, I think. It's kind of like the prototypical looter shooter. You know, you, you shoot a bunch of things, you collect more weapons to shoot more things. That That's how the gameplay goes. And the last thing I... Well, I guess not the last thing. I, I would say the last thing I expected was for there to ever be a Borderlands movie, but I'm just now remembering that in the last couple Borderlands games, they've actually slipped in a few like A list like act actors into the game as voice actors, just kind of for the hell of it. Yeah. Okay. So they've actually already announced the ca- like the A list cast list that we have for this: uh, Kate Blanchett, Jack Black, Jamie Lee Curtis, and Kevin Hart. So far, names that I've seen. Um, my bigger question is like, I mean, will people watch a Borderlands movie? I think so. I think. Um, Would a non Borderlands fan have a reason to? That I think that's why you're bringing all the A-listers. I guess to just get the mm. the regular folk because like there. there are people who I mean Jamie Lee Curtis, Jamie Lee Curtis will put p- cheeks and seats. Kevin Hart puts cheeks and seats. I think Jack Black still has that kind of pull. So. I mean, he was Bowser in the Mario movie. Yeah, so yeah. Deal. I mean, the the A-list talent will will bring people in just because they're bored of looking for a movie to watch. That's assuming the theater market is how it used to be because. You know, since the pandemic, people really don't see movies the way that they used to anymore. Yeah. But pre-pandemic, you know, they used to make all kinds of little, like, n- almost nonsense movies that just existed to go up during those downtimes between MCU movies where people are like, I need to do something this weekend. I'll see this. Do we know when it comes out? Uh, let me try and get my tablet to open again. Uh, let's see. Because, I mean, like, I I didn't get to see the Uncharted movie. But I heard that this is being made by the same people that worked on Uncharted. August 9th. August 9th. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a gander. I mean, I've only played one Borderlands game. I didn't play it to completion or anything, so I don't really remember too much about the world or stories, but I will gladly, you know, learn it in the theater. I've played a few Borderlands titles, but I mostly got into it after, um, they cl- after Gearbox closed down the... Um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the other game that I played. Uh, Bloodborne? That no, that's close, playing? but it's not Bloodborne. It's uh. Anyway, it's it's it was a uh, hero shooter, also by Gearbox, with irreverent characters and wacky storytelling. And when that game got shut down, I still had a desire for that style of storytelling and um, characters. And so I went to Borderlands, and I was not disappointed, not at all. Yeah, some people have been saying, or at least I, I know I've been saying and agreeing, that it feels like the 2020s are kind of the decade of like the video game movie. They have been hitting. I mean, we've hitting. had the, the two Sonic movies that have both been pretty well received. The Super Mario movie that's mm-hmm. been really well received. Even the Uncharted movie that, like, I don't know if it was like well received. I didn't hear awful things about I it. I didn't. I didn't hear bad things either. And so it kind of makes me think like maybe you know like we often talk about how like the 2010s was kind of the superhero decade, right? Feels like the decade before that was maybe the like teen fantasy like kind of mm. you know a lot of like Harry Potter, Twilight, 
that kind of thing. Percy Jackson, I guess you want to, some of those Hunger Games. Um, and maybe 2020 is like the, you know, the age of the video game movie. It could be, it could very well be. Now, my question is, so what will be the, because superhero movies, and then we had like the MC, the MCU to Endgame run. Yeah. That like, what was that, like? 20, 30 movies. Technically, yeah, like like twenty some movies. They they, they kind of like over about eleven. They completed years. the superhero era, right? What do you think will be the thing that completes the? You know, I still think we're pretty early into it. What do you think will complete? Like, what video game do you think will get the mo- will get the movie that just grips mm. the world? That's a great question. I mean. I almost don't want to think about it because mm-hmm. I think that the moment that you do, it's like you're kind of setting an expectation. And you know, like yeah. how it goes with like setting, you know, like setting expectations almost feels like why the MCU's newer phases are suffering is because like True. we're looking for like, please repeat the end game hype and surprise me again, even though I, I can't be surprised again. But yeah, if I had really to take a wild right. guess, I mean, so since they announced like a Zelda movie, right? I think the maybe the rash, like the, the logical end is like, the big Nintendo crossover where it basically is super smash bros in movies form where like Mario from the Mario movie, Zelda from the Zelda movie and like the Metroid and the star Fox and the Kirby and everything kind of like converges and they have a big crossover to fight master hand capitalism. I don't know something. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's, I think that could be pretty cool. Nintendo seems like they were really happy with the success of the Mario movie. And that's probably why right. they greenlit the Zelda one. What they will green lit, green light next. So uh. I have a theory. It's this wouldn't be a Nintendo movie. I think a Kingdom Hearts trilogy oh, could end wow. all of this. But how long would that take to come out? Like twenty no years? Idea. Don't those games take forever? No no idea. I don't know how it would be done. I don't I I mean, a live action Kingdom Hearts seems kind of difficult to do, but I'm surprised they're not trying to do something with Final Fantasy. Like I know they're re they're re releasing Advent Children in theaters. Yeah, like Advent Children. We cut. talked about that a few times on the pod. Now I think that's actually in, I think that's like today. Is that in on theaters today? I think so. Oh, I, I gotta I gotta go I see that. Go see that. But um, yeah. I mean, so either way, either <laughs> way, um, I will go and see this Borderlands movie. That yeah, me too. I'm it, I'm certainly gonna check it out. But it that's not that. all the movie news I have. It isn't. It is you not. You have more. Last, okay. I have one more. So, I'm happy to hear it. The MCU is reportedly undergoing creative retooling rather than a I feel reboot. like we hear this headline like every week. I mean, that's cuz people are starved for for like good MCU news. Great, let's hear it. What what's what's getting retooled? Who's restructuring? So, what does Marvel's creative retooling look like? While it's not immediately clear what it entails, uh, Disney CEO Bob Iger said on an earnings call earlier this month that to start, Marvel plans to reduce the number of movies and television series it puts out on a yearly basis. We talked about this on the pod. He said, some of our studios lost a little focus. Yeah. We can think of which movies seem they did not have their focus. Yeah. So the first step that we've taken is that we reduced the volume. We reduced output, particularly at Marvel, to ensure that the film... Sorry, my tablet's dying and it just... Oh, it's just kind of Yeah, it, it's up. barely staying on right now. So, there are currently four Marvel movies scheduled to release in 2025. Captain America, Brave New World, The Fantastic Four, which was recently announced, at least the cast list was, Thunderbolts, and Blade. Those two were announced so long ago, I forgot they were supposed to come out. Are they still coming out, I wonder? I, they, I guess so, 2025. Okay. Iger touted Captain America 4, starring Anthony Mackie, as among the 2025 Disney releases he is most excited for during the earnings call. Look, it has to be a hit or this is, or it's done. Yeah, okay. Uh, he did not mention Blade, leading to speculation it will be moved from its November 2025 date. If Blade gets pushed back again, they might as well just pull a Warner Brothers and cancel it. I think they just cancel it. They probably already have internally. It wouldn't surprise me anyway. I mean, they announced that shit like five years ago. Oh, and it's giving me the warning. It's about to turn off. Okay. All right, well, well that's enough what for was this the, Well, wait, what was the article? I can look it up on mine. It was like Hollywood Something Insider like Creative Retooling. Creative retooling. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because I don't mind the lower output for what it's worth. Like the Because uh, I believe the article is supposed to mention how the Kang Dynasty is being removed from the name of that next Avengers pick. I don't think they said what the new name is, but it won't be the Kang Dynasty. Yeah, so they're kind of phasing out the Kang character. 
And I think, and reportedly, and this, this I have not confirmed this, they were actually going to move away from Kang even before Jonathan Majors lost that lawsuit. Allegedly. Yeah. He, no, okay. he didn't allegedly lose the lawsuit. He certainly lost it. They're going to be slowing output. Um, the only Marvel film in 2024 will be Deadpool and Wolverine. Um, it seems to be off to a great start. On the streaming side of things, we'll only see two MCU shows this year. Thank God. Echo, which was already released, and Agatha Darkhold Diaries. Ooh, that's not, that's not good. Which just completed a single day of reshoots earlier this month. So they had to reshoot some things. It's not surprising. Um... I think the goal with Agatha is to lose as little money as possible. According to THR, Marvel is feeling very positive about the Agatha show, which they plan to release through Disney Plus sometime this fall. I mean, I have to say that. The gap between releases is meant to, quote, give creatives some breathing room and give audiences the chance to miss the MCU just a little bit. I think Agatha needs that. I think I, <laughs> I think Agatha needs that. Yeah, so, um, interesting. I mean, like, yeah, some of our studios lost a little focus. So the first step we've taken is that we've reduced volume. We've reduced output, particularly at Marvel, to ensure the films you're making can be even better. Which, cool. I mean, yeah. I think everyone kind of complained about the Marvel output in the last uh, three years. They were just going gas, 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 gas. And I completely blame, uh, well, corporate America. P- always pushing for more and more profits. Never being satisfied with what they have. Yeah, Marvel publicly dropped Majors just hours after his conviction, but we've been left wondering how they're going to handle the Kang character, especially since one of the films in the 2026 release schedule is titled Avengers Kang Dynasty. That film is currently undergoing rewrites that will minimize the character or excise him entirely. That's the quote. So don't expect it to end up being called the Kang Dynasty when it's released. Interesting. Um, What a shame. They actually said that they were moving toward minimizing the character before Majors was convicted after Quantumania, where Kang was the lead villain, underperformed. So when Quantumania underperformed, they were like, okay, we're going to maybe drop this guy. Because the, the, honestly, with if Quantumania is, was supposed to be the movie that made us ref, ref, uh, respect and fear Kang, then yeah, they really failed. So, interesting. Um... Do you think this is going to save the MCU, or do you think it's like a good... No, uh, it's going to be Deadpool. You think Deadpool's going to save it? Yeah. Um, I think when Deadpool and Wolverine releases, I, I think it's it's all, it's one of those movies that's successful before it even comes out. As long as they don't completely botch this, I think Marvel will once again start doing rewrites again to work off of whatever people liked about that movie. Yeah. Marvel's known for the rewrites. Okay, cool. I mean... I'm for a little bit lower output. Like, frankly, I did not mind, like, watching a new Disney Plus show every three months. Except that over time, I guess I... Like, when they were coming out, I didn't mind. I was, like, kind of excited about them. But then I, I look at them in hindsight, I feel like the, the quality took a dive. I had ener- I had plenty of energy for the MCU TV shows, but then they gave us Secret Invasion. And it left the worst taste in my mouth that I've ever had since Venom 2. Yeah. Well... I don't know. I mean, good luck to Marvel. I hope for the best for them. You guys know how I am. I'm not rooting for companies to fail. I think that if they can get a grip on what's going on and, like, turn things around, mm-hmm. that is a net win for all of us. I do not want, like, oh, Marvel to just give up. Like, some people on the internet, I guess, seem to think. I really thought a good turning point for Marvel was going to be the Blade uh, TV or movie. I forget what it was supposed to be at this and point. Now they just keep pushing it back. It's like... Yeah, it, it keeps getting pushed back. I thought that Marvel really needed kind of a genre shift so that not everything they put out is just this obvious superhero movie. Blade would have been a more supernatural movie, more akin to like the Underworld franchise. So, you know, you're not just expecting superhero poses, landings, and like lots of like superpower and screaming. Well... Anywho, uh, here's a related one. Uh, last week on the podcast, we mentioned that we would be taking a look at Madam Web. Sure and now that did. we've seen the movie, I'd like to hear your thoughts on Madam Web because mm-hmm. it obviously was not uh, super well received by critics. It had a very low Rotten Tomatoes score. Um, and there was some, I'm going to actually look up his Rotten Tomatoes score, but there was some sort of like disagreement around like, fans and stuff like is it really that bad why is it bad is it because there's a woman in the movie you know people always cite that, that certainly didn't help for a lot of people yeah so um 
I would like to hear your thoughts, Alec, after so, having seen this movie. I, I knew I was going to watch Meta Web from the beginning, but I will say uh, when they first, I first saw the trailer, I did ask, like, why are they making this? It didn't feel like there was any demand or desire for a Madam Web series, and I certainly didn't have one. But I, I, from the little bit I saw and from the uh, actors involved, I was like, you know what? I'll give it. A, I'll give it a try. I don't. I don't really. Ha- I don't have anything against Madam Web or the people associated with it. Mm-hmm. So I, we saw the movie, yep. and there are certainly some issues I took with the movie. But not enough for me to say that this is one of my least favorite movies I've, I've ever watched. I didn't feel like I wasted my time. I did feel like they bait and switched people a bit, though. Okay. Because, you know, they 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 marketed it as if you'd get these kind of spider fights. Yeah. There's multiple There's people the in spider, the costumes. spider costumes. There's the villain in the spider costume. So you think you're going to see some, like, web swinging and... Oh, yeah, fair warning, Spo- we're going to be spoiler review. So if you haven't seen the movie and plan to, stop here. But anyway, I doubt. I doubt. Yeah. I mean, I really doubt that you've made it like an hour and a half into a podcast about this and you haven't seen it. But yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, they just kind of bait and switch you. They don't, they they actually, the amount of spidiness that you see in the trailers is actually all you get in the movie, too. There is no more of that. In fact, you find out that really nobody's, like a, a, sp- a really a spider person and, and the bad Madam- guy is probably the closest you yeah, get to he's it. the closest you get and he doesn't have web abilities and then madam web herself the main character she's uh, it's hard to even call her a superhero in the modern sense because she kind of she can't fight and yeah. she and she doesn't yeah. in the entire movie <laughs> well uh so right now it's at thirteen percent on the tomato meter. Woo! The audience score is fifty six percent. Okay. Okay. So to start off my review, I will say that I agree more with the audience score. Mm-hmm. I think that this is a movie that is not at all a great movie. Yeah, it's it's not definitely not. I stomach. would maybe even hesitate to call it a, a good movie, but I think it is a passable one. And there are some things that I did like. I think that for the first half of the movie, I liked the vibe. Um, Mm -hmm. like kind of the atmosphere that it built was really nice. It felt, um, very ground level superhero. I'm always going to be a big fan of that. I was like a big fan of Marvel Netflix shows and stuff. You know, they kind of felt a little Jessica Jones, a little Luke Cage, a little Daredevil. Right. Like not so much in how the fights and stuff went, obviously, but more like just in the, the, the tone, the life. It took place with like, it felt like real people in real life. Real people kind of, Yeah. Uh, I like that kind of dark blue color palette that's used in a lot of the early scenes and stuff. Kind of just it's, it's kind of moody, um, and I do like some of the messaging that was at play. Although like some of it was a little, eh. but like I like the idea that you know she is not so much a superhero, but just that she has taken responsibility over these three girls who are who are being like targeted by somebody right. who wants to kill them. And, you know, despite not really wanting to take responsibility for these girls or help them out, she inadvertently ends up doing so. And I thought that that was kind of nice. Um, her power set, where she can, like, kind of just Im- see the immediate future, uh, kind of in flashes. She can even see the distant future. She doesn't, didn't have a lot of control of that, though. Yeah, like, you know, it. she doesn't fight. Like, so it, it's not a superhero movie in that way. And I think that that is a little disappointing that you don't maybe get more action Mm-hmm. Really, you just kind of get her effectively dodging action, like dodging yeah. danger by like kind of you know. At the end, you get some, but I think the biggest issue I probably had with the movie was just that like the pacing is kind of awkward. There are some points where it really jumps a lot. There are points where you can almost you know smell the rewrites and reshoots sort of that were happening, the dub overs and all that. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, I I don't think it's like a thirteen percent. I, I think like the uh, it's just not a great movie. I will say this, uh, and it's kind of like I'm throwing some bail to a lot of people who are like, never in my life will I watch this. Nobody wanted a Madam Web movie. It's kind of similar to my situation, my feelings about the Agatha movie. I mean, the TV series that the uh, MCU is making. Mm-hmm. Madam Web, if you know the character, is not a character that anyone would ever claim is their favorite character. 
the she's kind of a um she's a device in the comics as far as helping Spider-Man and other spider people get from point A to point B in their plot lines. She's a kind of an interme- intermediary. Yeah. And so it felt weird to make a movie about her where you get to know her and her problems before she truly becomes Madam Web. But like at the end of the day, I actually didn't want to know or care. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that it just it's she being not really a superhero, it's kinda of difficult to invest yourself a lot mm-hmm. in it. And um there were other things I that I could probably poke some holes in. Like I don't I think the villain was just cringe. <laughs> from, from how he spoke to what his goals were, I just found like he was just extremely cringy. And I and that's like a word I don't like using, but it, it's the only one that comes to mind. He's one of those like bad villains you know uh, to me and i think for most people a good villain is is a villain who it's hard to say they're actually evil yeah where you can somewhat relate to them or something like they have their reasons and you you kind of you kind of get it to some degree you're like okay i know why you're doing all this you shouldn't be doing it but i do get it they don't tell his story very well at all. I mean, you see from the start that he's just a bad guy. He's willing to literally well, like, betray her mother and like kill people to get the spider hints, and then he's like angry that like, the people might kill him eventually. While he's doing it, he does hint that he has his reasons that he they're like untold on screen, he cl- he kind of hints that I have reasons, I have gone through things that make such despicable acts necessary and we just but don't they don't them. tell us that and so he just kind of does bad things which is where it reeks of like rewrites and like kind of reshoots and just cut content mm-hmm. um so i didn't find the villain very enticing i think of the, the teenage girls that she's like working with i really would have liked to see them eventually kind of get their powers and like kind of be able to fight i think that's what the that's where a lot of the poor reviews come from because they expected that you put them in the costume and things they knew what they were doing they put those girls in the costume for a reason they want to set the expectation they could because they see the thing is they could have just told people that this is not the story of those girls getting their powers but they didn't instead they put them in costumes and put them in trailers and because they knew this movie probably wasn't yeah like, cause thing is, and here's the, and this is the messed up part. A movie about any one of those girls would have been more interesting than Madame Web. It's a shame too, because I think that the girls, um, as characters were interesting enough. Like they had kind of personality quirks, and they acted how I would imagine like teenagers to act. So in terms of like, they don't have the best decision making and like rationale, mm-hmm. but also they kind of grow closer, and you know they kind of stick together. Their stories would have been more interesting to see than I think, you know, our main character who is just sort of like getting by, like it's doesn't like, really have a, it didn't feel like our main character even had much of a stake in the fight until she found out that like the bad guy killed her mom, but like he wasn't even after her. So it was really, the, it was a little disjointed in that way. I, I, I don't know if we talked about this after the movie, but see, each of the girls are a, they are they are actual comic book characters. Each of them is a Spider Girl or Spider Woman character in the comics. They all do get powers, and they they all have their own fan bases within the Marvel like comic reading community. So it it was strange then to make them all to put them together because none of these these girls don't run in teams in the comics. They yeah. they kind of put them together underneath Madam Web. I guess Sony wanted to to introduce them, but I really think not a great, they should have just given one of them a movie, a solo movie, or maybe you give them all their own movies. I don't know, but Madam Webb was not the bridge we needed for this. I feel like Madam Webb in some ways doesn't even feel like a movie. It feels like I remember coming out of thinking like this might've made for like a better TV show, Mm -hmm. a kind of a TV drama because there's just not enough action like, pulling you through, like, a movie, but it could have worked as a bit of a, like, creepy kind of just, you know, not surveillance, but, like, there's a person chasing after you and you have to kind of get away from them. That as, like, a... That might have worked better as a show. I do think that there was this kind of horror vibe that they put one foot in. Because in those earlier scenes... Yeah, they don't dive super deep into it. 
Yeah, because like in those earlier scenes where the spider guy is like tracking them and stalking them, there is this kind of horror-ish element, and then they kind of do away with it like pretty quickly, pretty quickly. So do I think it's a 13%? No. If you had expectations, I think it's a 13%. Yeah, I think it, as far as betraying expectations goes, yeah, it's, it's pretty low. I think as a thing to watch, maybe I give it a forty or fifty. I think yeah, to and that's kind of sad in a way because that means you just kind of have to go into it without too being. You have to not be too critical of a person and have already made your peace with knowing, like you know, I'm not going to love this movie, but I'll check it out. Yeah. Now I will say this. Um, I know there are some people who just kind of like to see these movies fail. Whether it's because they think Sony Marvel stuff sucks or, like, they don't like, you know, women in the MCU, which just isn't even really like an MCU movie. But, you know, some people don't like, like, that pisses people off, I've found. Mm-hmm. Or some people don't, you know, they just, there's so many reasons why people kind of will, like, look at these movies ahead of release and be like, oh, I just, I want it to fail or whatever. I think this is a movie that seemed a little troubled. Like, they just weren't sure exactly what direction to go. They probably redid a lot of things, reshot a lot of things, cut a lot of stuff. Fundamentally, I, I end with where you probably are, which is I don't think she's the character for it. I don't think that Madam Webb is... She's just not that interesting. I think that maybe as a show, it could have. there's like a possibility. I think that the girls becoming spider people might have been more exciting, so... It is what it is. Look, it's out now. Uh, check it out if you got time. Uh, it'll be on streaming services soon enough. Yeah, you can watch it. Uh, yeah, so, all right, I've got um, a little update on the Xbox next-gen sort of oh, showcase yeah, we, stuff. We are getting a console. Yeah, there's going to be a next-gen Xbox console, or at least a, a large technical leap in a hardware generation. So basically an Xbox Series X Pro or something. Okay. Xbox is not exiting the hardware market anytime soon as the company announced it has a multi-year roadmap that includes a next-generation Xbox in the future. During the latest episode of the Xbox official podcast, President Sarah Bond addressed the role hardware plays in Xbox's future. She concurred with an earlier statement by Xbox head Phil Spencer that Xbox hardware would remain the flagship experience for players despite the company's plans to go multi-platform moving forward. So, yes, they are planning on going multi-platform with their games, but Mm -hmm. they're going to be delivering a new console this holiday and um so what we're focused on there is delivering the largest technical leap you will have ever seen in a hardware generation which makes it better for players and better for creators and the visions they're building she explains so uh she did not specify exactly what that would entail although um there have been some leaks in the past that involve like a mid-gen xbox series x refresh codenamed brooklyn that is apparently more compact than the original and lacks a disk drive, has two terabytes of internal storage, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and um, an updated Series S that's codenamed Elwood, which will have 10 gigs of RAM, but um, we're not sure exactly how that'll go. That's weird for them to upgrade the Series X and the S. I thought they were going to drop the S. It, it makes more sense to me to drop the S, because... Like if you're gonna, because I think the S's upgrade is the X. So why make like a, why make an an S an S Pro and an X and an X Pro? I hope they don't. I think that would just complicate the market a little bit too much. I mean, I think that the bigger so the bigger thing with the story is that people are, if you're an Xbox fan at least, you're probably happy to hear that Microsoft is not going to be exiting the console market at least not immediately. Yeah, <laughs> showed you Sony ponies. Yeah, so. Take that, right? But um, <laughs> this doesn't even confirm that. Like, those are still just leaks that people had seen, like the the Series mm. X and X stuff. Um, it could mean something that's entirely different, according to this article. Microsoft has clarified that it wants games to be experienced across various devices, such as streaming sticks. Um, yet the court document leaks also revealed that Xbox was exploring concepts for a few different devices, from a one hand controller and, more interestingly, a handheld device. Though, um, whether it's a device focused more on cloud gaming or something that's more of a handheld PC like a Steam Deck is not entirely clear. Hmm. There's all kinds of ways that Xbox could really go in the future. And if you ask me, this whole thing kind of feels like a pointlet. Like, like when you look at it, we all, this is all stuff we kind of knew. It's just that, like, it could go any which way. So. Yeah, it just says, Xbox has options. Yeah, Xbox could do a few different things, and it, they plan on doing it something this yeah, year. Fair. But, um... You know, I, I'm glad that they will at least be finishing out this generation with like some sort of a, a hardware refresh. Right. I think that they probably need it. 
And the fans probably need it for their sanity, I suppose. The war continues. So, pretty cool. Um, any other stories? I got nothing. And it's t- if, if I did, the tab was gone. Oh, yeah, I forgot. All right, I'll quickly go over some of the stuff that was shown at the Nintendo Direct Partner Showcase. I don't know if what you, got? Um, you care too much for any of these games. It but depends. You got to tell me. I'll just mention some highlights. I'm going to do thumbs up and thumbs down. Yeah, so Monster Hunter Stories. Thumbs up. It's a 2017 Nintendo 3DS RPG spinoff of Monster Hunter that's going to be headed to the Switch as well as the PS4 and Steam. In addition to HD visuals, this port includes new voiceovers, a museum mode, and additional content previously only available in Japan. I like the uh, the stories uh, game. That was that, uh, it was a it was certainly a different take on Monster Hunter. I thought it was cool. Disney Epic Mickey rebrushed. So this is from the 2011 Epic Mickey game. Thumbs down. I don't remember it. Um, it's getting touched up for a comeback on Switch. The enhanced remake includes updated graphics, new skills for Mickey, and other improvements. Shin Megami Tensei Five Vengeance. Thumbs up. I just the like SMT. The definitive version of SMT Five includes the base adventure along with a new storyline featuring new locations and demons. Star Wars Battlefront Classic Collection. Two thumbs up. Actually, three. the original Battlefront games have been remastered and updated with features such as new playable characters Kit Fisto. Wait, wait. There's new playable, playable characters? characters Kit Fisto. Oh yeah, four thumbs and up. And Asajj Ventress. Asajj Ventress. Oh, say less. And bonus maps, Jabba's Palace, Bespin Cloud City, and Yavin 4 Arena. Oh, yeah, we in there. Y'all, we in there. There's Sword Art Online, Fractured Daydream. I don't know if it's a thumbs up or not. Either alone or with a friend in co-op, you'll tackle a distorted version of Sword Art Online that includes battling in 20-player raids against powerful enemies. I guess that's a thumbs up. I don't know. I'm mixed on Sword Art. How about Gundam Breaker 4? Thumbs up. Build your own Gundam, blow up other mechs, and take their parts for your own and repeat. For Gunpla fans, the real thrill is assuming assembling your own suits with parts from 250 base kits to take into battle or show off to others. The uh, the Gundam Breaker series has pretty good customization as far as Gunpla building. My only issue with the gun with that series was I have not cared for the gameplay of the Gundam Breaker games. It feel for me, it's felt too surface level. Mm-hmm. And part and a little too repetitive. Hopefully, Gundam Breaker Four can kind of break the mold on that. Yeah, so that's just a few of the games that kind of took my interest. There's a lot more you guys can check out the Nintendo Direct. It was just earlier today when we're filming this, but I guess I yesterday if the when Battlefront, you see it. Uh, like this Battlefront, uh, like collect collection will be available on more than just Switch. I think so. I think I said it's like on PS4 and Steam. Because if it Steam, say less on PS5 on PC, Steam. y'all bringing it. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't need that EA stuff. I need this injected directly into my veins. Yeah, you were a big fan of the Battlefronts. I remember I had a, a cousin who really loved the Battlefront games on like PS2. Yeah, Battlefront yeah. and Battlefront Two. Oh my god, perfect yeah. games. Cool. So I think that's everything that we've got for stories. So it's time to reach into the pot of greed. Let's talk to the pot, y'all. Answer some of you guys' viewer questions. Yeah, guys. And if you want to add your own questions to the pot, make sure you hit the Google form link in the description. Oh, that's not one. Yeah, you can submit any questions Here and we we'll go. try to get around to them. Um... All right. So, will there ever be a third channel to show other TCGs? I think not. Probably I think two is enough. Yeah, I think, I, think, I mean. We already have, like, our own kind of... Like, I've sometimes been wanting to, like, just have the Pot of Greed have its own channel. Mm-hmm. But now that we're so deep into it, I feel like it would be a waste to, like, start a new one because there would be, like, a real fall-off and people who just wouldn't know where it right. is. I mean, you guys can let us know if you'd like a channel that's just Pot of Greed episodes. I mean, we tried to do the Pot of Greed Clips channel, and I just wasn't able to really keep up with the workload of it, unfortunately. Clipping things is annoying. So, um... I don't, I mean, we just, we play a lot of card games, but like not in as much detail as I think is needed to like do a video on them. If and, that if, makes sense. and if we were to, and if we do do videos on other card games, they kind of just go up on here on APS Amplifier. Yeah, like we'll occasionally open something different and that's mm. usually kind of what we'll do. But other than that. Uh, There's a new TCG I want to try. Like I think pretty much every new TCG that comes out, you can expect us to at least give it a shot. Like. Mm. With, like, some sort of an opening of, like, the first set or, like, a starter deck or something like that. But, um, a new channel for it seems a bit much. I feel like if I was to start a third channel, I mean, we tried to do one for, like, you know, live streaming. Didn't really work out. Um, 
I sometimes think it'd be fun to have like a just an unboxing channel mm. where it's just literally like TCG unboxings and we just unbox or we just open packs all day. But I don't know. I mean, our uh, manpower is kind of limited. Uh, Paul does most of it, and I do the rest. So yeah, it would be it'd be tough. Um, and there's already channels that I feel like just open every card game. Pack. Like I don't know that we would be offering anything. There's much new to be offered in hey, that. Us oh. doing it would be the difference maker. I, I guess. suppose so. Okay. Uh, my question is more PVE in Master Duel? Question uh, mark. There could be Time Wizard format, or they could be in Time Wizard format. I think uh, Master Duel sure needs it. Mm-hmm. I think um, Master Duel could really benefit from like because I mean they have the solo gates, and they're actually pretty cool. Like there's a little bit more to them than I think people give them credit for, but like. Like, once they're done, they're done. When they're done, they're done, and, like, there's not really any reason to go back to them. I think, like, you know, some some dual modes where you can play against the AI in a Time Wizard format, like in GOAT or Edison, could be pretty fun. Um, Will they do it? I don't... I Master Duel, they, they drag their feet with, like, a lot of these new modes, so... Like, Master they don't seem to like to add... These like new features, they'll add, they'll have, they'll add events and cards. Yeah, events and formats. Features, mm. features probably not. Although like a time wizard format is something that they seem to be experimenting with because they announced that there's like a dual trial that's gonna have like mm-hmm. kind of the goat format thing. So see, I mean, I see events are custom ban list, sure, but that that'll be PvP. I'm yeah, just saying that's what they're gonna be. I do think Master Duel could use more PVE. It just feels like it's a game that's um. All you can do is ladder for the yeah. most part, and uh, it'd be nice if there was like a little bit more flavor outside of that. But they'll take their time. They will. All right, let me grab. I would like to see it though. If I ever get the chance to talk to a master duel dev, um, rest assured that I will make that known. I've already told them they need a music changer, and it's, we still don't have one. So I guess we saw how far that went. Yeah, they don't care what I have to say. Be nice if they did. Okay, this is this will uh, this speaks to our experience at Rare Hunters. This person asks asks, will there ever be more retro packs, and why is Retro Pack One so expensive? Uh, oh, you're talking about the actual set Retro Pack yes. One. Oh man, the, the, will there be a no? No, no that's done, y'all. I'm, the, I'm pretty sure Konami's just types not of doing that. Reprint packs are over with. However, um, we had a conversation the other day about how I think that they should actually reprint like. The special editions? Well, going back to special editions would be fun. I think mm-hmm. they should do more special editions for regular packs. But what I was going to say is I think that they need to... Uh, you know they did like the first kind of legendary collection where it was like the first four sets plus Dark Crisis and kind of IOC or whatever. The skipping my best, my yeah, favorite skip set. Legacy of Darkness and like Magician's Force and stuff. I think Legacy of Darkness, Magician's Force, like those sets, Ancient Sanctuary... You know, oh, maybe, I don't know what maybe not. I mean, it's not that good. Mm-hmm. But like those next kind of few retro sets, um, would be really cool to see. Yeah, Veronic Guardian. So, so some of those they introduce some really cool stuff, and I think you just re- it would be so people could like do their own progression series in real life, do mm-hmm. their own you know kind of like retro formats cubes, and maybe you don't sell the packs for like four bucks a pack or four and a half they're old it's full of vanillas and like crappy monsters i think that you kind of you put them together where it's like you can get the first 10 Yu-Gi-Oh sets Mm -hmm. and for like it's like for 25 bucks or something and you get one of each or something i don't know i think people would like that i think people would appreciate the ability to play um you know just like play retro in an accessible way this gave me an idea okay what if Konami, because I was just thinking, because we just read thing about the uh, Star Wars organized play kit, and you know it it was it had kind of a league system that it worked with. What if Konami came out with a product for shops where it's like a, it's a progression series product made for let's say eight people, and it just every week you're supposed you're to just shop. that would be really. That they could do that, man. Oh, cool. And since, it, since such a thing would be too expensive for like an individual to buy, but if a shop were to buy it to support their local, local community scene. and they just yeah. buy in, mm. that could be something. Um, we'll take our 50% cut, Konami. <laughs> the idea. All right. Well, um, any stories about cheating in Yu Gi Oh? 
I have never cheated in a Yu-Gi-Oh game my entire life. You can go on record because I said that. I'm pretty sure I cheated as a kid. <gasps> but no, as far as like stories about like just experiencing cheating, um, hmm, let me think. Have I ever been cheated in Yu Gi Oh? I mean, I'm pretty sure when, in schoolyard days, uh, kids were cheating left. I think and we were right. all cheating in, in school but, in the schoolyard. Um, as an adult, I have not encountered very much cheating. I think the closest I've seen is there was, like, one guy I know at Locals whose name will remain anonymous. This is, like, years and years and years ago, though, so it's nobody recent. Two weeks ago. It was, like, no. Yeah, that's right. It was last <laughs> week. Uh, you no, know, it was a guy who was pretty known for, like, he had a reputation for being quite good at Yu-Gi-Oh!, but as it turns out, he usually just cheated. Like, he would just draw two cards, like, every turn. Wow. And that was his whole thing, is just that he would draw. He two. always had card advantage. How yeah, does he, he have so always, many cards? I mean, that was also during the time in Yu Gi Oh! where like, card advantage was like a big thing. Mm-hmm. So he was like literally known for always having card advantage and kind of being like, it's like, oh, he just cheats. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, that's all it is. He just he would draw, like, just double draw and stuff. That's it. I mean, I think as a kid, uh, when Alex wouldn't look, I would like snatch a second card off my deck or something. Yeah. But um, I don't know. As an adult, I haven't run too much like cheating. Uh, situations. You know what's interesting about cheating in Yu-Gi-Oh nowadays is I feel like most argument, like I think that there's kind of a assumption that no one really like cheat cheats in Yu-Gi-Oh, like the hard cheating, you know, mm. that kind of thing. You don't really see very much stacking. It feels like because everybody's so attentive to like shuffling decks and you know all that. I don't feel like anybody like draws two because everyone's just so aware of how many cards are in hand and what's going on. I think what you hear about with cheating more now is, like, just presumptive stuff. Like, or he asked... Maybe illegal activations. Illegal activations, maybe illegal game states, or, like, kind of these weird things. Like, there was, like, a... There was, like, this one question, and people in the comments can maybe weigh in on this, of, like, is it cheating slash just BM or dishonest or whatever to... Tell your opponent, I'm entering battle phase to bait out their uh, main phase effects when you don't actually have, like, anything that you could use in battle phase. Like, you don't have evenly matched or whatever, but you use it to force them to use their IP Mascarena. I mean, the thing is, I mean, it just, I think it's just, that's more of a tactical thing than, like, a cheating thing. Yeah, so it's like, an, whether or not that's cheating, I don't really know, but that's, like, the most I hear about it. It's just... And I think it's, a, it's one of those scenarios. Because it's one of those things I think that only works once, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Yu Gi Oh's best two out of three. Your opponent, if your opponent, if you know your opponent plays evenly matched, like maybe they use it in game one, and now it's game three, I think that's more of a tactical thing. If they declare, they don't have the evenly matched, but they declare it anyway because they know you know that they've used it. Like, well, I guess that by declare you just mean like saying like end of battle or yeah they yeah, like okay. they declare they move into their battle and you're like oh no he's gonna evenly match me but um it's kind of a tactical thing is it is it a little scummy sure I don't think you it's should be like doing that in casual cheating, games I like I don't think you should do that in casual games for sure just because it will leave a bad taste in your opponent's mouth I'll leave it for the judges to probably decide if that's because maybe that is like a punishable we I, I haven't heard anything about someone being punished for it right yeah i don't know that's a good question though what do you guys think like is kind of the whole like entering battle end of battle to like bait stuff out and then you don't actually have evenly is it just kind of a fair mind game and like it's I mean, up to your opponent to resist because like the rule in Yu-Gi-Oh is like if you declare you're doing something you have to do it so as long as they're not declaring they're going to go into or out of a phase and then they just try not to afterwards then well, so I guess the tricky part with that is that if I say end of main phase and now you have to, like, you feel tempted to use your IP Mascarena now because she can mm-hmm. only be used in the main phase, then the moment that you use that, it's the main phase, we stay in the main phase. Right, the main phase so can continue. It's But if I never actually had evenly to begin with, then I just was able to force your card out for free with just a word or, like, you know, a phrase – and now I still get to continue my main phase and like deal with whatever you summon with IP mask right now. It's kind like, of dishonest. It can, but it also you but can get like, you can get kind of burned for it because if you do, yeah, that, if they don't take the bait, and then you go into your battle you phase, your battle phase you d- and you, you do don't nothing. have evenly, and then you go into main, so now you don't even get a battle. Yeah, so like, because IP's back alive in main phase too. There's there's some risk. They're like, so. so I mean, you know, it, it's just one of those things. I think that's kind of abusing 
the way Yu-Gi-Oh works for, to your advantage. Abusing game states and phase changes. And, and I think there's probably more than just that example of plenty. just little things you can do to try plenty. and get an advantage on I've your opponent. I've heard so many. I mean, I know that there's like, there was the guy uh, who came under some controversy or with like having the Sky Striker token Oh extra yeah, deck or whatever, or the Mecha Phantom Beast, like some token where people thought he was playing one deck, mm-hmm. but he was playing another. So, like that, that, and that. Now that's not even a gameplay thing. That's just manipulation of your opponent. <laughs> Which you know, for what it's worth, that's actually why I part of why I've never enjoyed. I say never enjoyed. I have gotten a little bit less infatuated with like competing in person at these high level events mm-hmm. because like. One benefit to Master Duel is, like, none of that can happen. I mean, it's True. Just, it just is what it is, so. Whatever. Anyway, that's it for the pod, I suppose. Yeah, we've asked our questions to the pod of Greed, and uh, we, or the, or you guys asked the pod, and we answered, so. Yeah, we, the pod gave us the questions. Yeah, that's Something. what happened. Anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed. Um, Sorry about me being sick this week. I know Ugh. it's probably a little insufferable. It's but, a package of germs. Yeah. Uh, Ouch. <laughs> Jeez, I'm going to be so mean. Well, we all are, technically. That's true. All right. Anywho, we will see you all next week on the Pod of Greed. Give us any suggestions, stories, questions, whatever else. We'll see you guys in the next one. Pass Pass turn. turn.